if we could have your attention. Brad, can you hear me? Okay. Well, first of all, on behalf of Providence and the uh, Providence Men Group, uh, welcome to our first uh, men's get-together. Um, it's a little bit after the fact, but we last uh, asked Pastor Bill to please um, bless this meal and this evening, and then we'll start. Pastor? Well, I too want to welcome you. We're glad you're here tonight. It's going to be a great night, and we appreciate um, Stan being with us and, and Rick, who's going to be our host, um, or our MC, I guess, our MC. Um, but I promised, I promised Rick I wouldn't take up too much time. But, but I am going to pray. But I wanted to share with you a joke, because I thought to myself, OK, we got a bunch of men here. Um, it is a perfect time for a mother-in-law joke, OK? <laughs> So a guy goes on vacation in the Holy Land with his wife and mother-in-law. The mother-in-law dies while she's in the Holy Land. So the couple goes to an undertaker who explains that they can ship the body home, but it'll cost over $5,000. Whereas burying her in the Holy Land would cost only $150. We'll ship her home, says the guy. Well, his wife is pretty moved that the tenderness of her husband towards his mother-in-law. So she goes out to the car while he signs all the documents to have her shipped back home. And the undertaker asks him, sir, are you sure? That's an awfully big expense and we can do a very nice burial here for only $150. The guy says, hey, look, look, 2,000 years ago, they buried a guy here and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take that chance. Okay. That concludes our evening. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. So let us pray. Dear gracious God, we give thanks tonight for just this beautiful weather, um, for gathering us together in, in your amazing creation. Um, for the guys around these picnic tables, uh, we pray for old friendships and new friendships, um, that the fellowship around um, these tables will bring you glory and cause you joy. Uh, we pray for the food we have eaten. We pray that you'll bless it to our bodies um, so we will be your faithful disciples. And, and again, we, we give thanks for um, Stan Smith and for him sharing his faith story with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Bill, thank you. Uh, before we start, a, a quick thank you. Um, several years ago, Maury Purcell thought about the idea of starting a men's group. Unfortunately, COVID hit. So now we're back in the process. Uh, today is our first get together, over 100 people, uh, 80 members, which is great, about 20 guests. Thank you, guests, um, including you, John Wall. Who are you? And, um, but it's, it's nice to have everybody here on a beautiful evening. And, and Maury, thank you for heading up this uh, pastor, this uh, Presbyterian group. We appreciate it. And Tom Rash our grill master, thank you very much. Larry Holden, back our, our, church, our treasurer, helping out. Greg Vivinti, um, doing, um, working his magic on the salads. And the fellow committee members, uh, Greg Schaus, Alan Fu, Cliff McBacken, Brad Parker, Greg Ellison, and Mark Olson. Uh, these are the nine or 10 gentlemen that are going to work with us, hopefully on about four events a year, every 90 days. It may be a get together, it may be a cookout, it may be a round of golf. Who knows? We're open to ideas. Uh, we have this great evening with Stan, um, a fellow, a longtime Islander and a fellow Providence member. And then we've got somebody booked in September as well. So we're looking forward to getting us together. Stan is originally from Pasadena, California. Um, he went to USC, U not our USC. He kept it on the West Coast. At USC, he was a three-time All-American. Um, in 1968, hard to believe, he was the NCEA uh, singles champion. Congratulations on that. Turned pro in 1969 and had a career including 64 singles titles and 40, 54 doubles titles. Um, pretty strong. 
1971, he was our U.S. Open champion. And in 1972, he was a Wimbledon singles champion. Um, in addition to that, he holds four U.S. Open doubles titles. Um, and he opens, he has one Australian Open doubles title. And Stan, um, the, um, a lot of pros today don't pay attention to doubles as you obviously did in some of your compatriots, but um, explain yourself. <laughs> well, on that topic, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. It is the first time we've done this, and uh, uh, it's a great setting, isn't it, to, to come out here in this pavilion, and especially on a night like tonight. Um, and we have a great group here, the great congregation here at, uh, at Providence, we meet actually here in the morning. Bill preaches right out here at 8.30, and then we go into the main uh, chapel or main sanctuary at 10.30 for the, for the big service. But we have about 80 or 90 people out here in the morning. You can hear the birds sing, and, and uh, some, sometimes you can hear the ocean breaking if the wind's blowing the right way. But uh, back in the day, I played doubles. Actually, all the players played doubles uh, until Connors and Borg uh, started coming along and played only singles, and uh, then we, <laughs> the guys like me, you know, figured out that uh, a little too late that, you know, if you're playing singles in the quarterfinals and you play a best of five set match and you play a doubles match five sets, and uh, then you play semifinals and it rains, you play two days in a row five sets singles and doubles, and some of the guys played mixed. They figured out finally that. The guy that only plays singles doesn't have to do that. You're going to be much fresher in the singles match. And, of course, singles is getting the, the most exposure and the most prize money. And, uh, unfortunately, by that time, I was finished playing. <laughs> so um, the guys like um, – actually, McEnroe played. He's probably the last guy to play singles and doubles pretty consistently. And he did it because he – it was good practice for him to get, you know, instead of going out on the practice court – he would play a doubles match and get a little more play, and, and that kept him sharper. Next question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Or you Stan, to Stan, Stan retired um, uh, in 1985 and was honored to be inducted into the International um, Hall of Fame in 1987. Um, since then, um, you've had quite an association with the Hall of Fame. You served as president for many years. Yeah, I've been president of the Hall of Fame for 10 years. I'd stepped down last year, and uh, it was, uh, if you ever get a chance to go see the, it's called the Newport Casino, which is a strange name, but it's a tennis facility. It actually had the first U.S. championships played in Newport at this club, and uh, has the history of, of back in the uh, 1800s. But um, the... The facility has been uh, redone several times. We raised uh, quite a bit of money to, to improve the museum. And uh, I always said when I was the president that all the great players, arguably, are members of the Hall of Fame. There's 262 players from 27 different countries uh, who have been inducted in the Hall of Fame. Now, some of these are contributors, not just players, but contributors of the, 100, of the 262. But... Uh, arguably all the best players that have ever played the game. And so when you get a player like a Sampras, for instance, that was inducted about uh, 15 years ago, uh, obviously he was going to be inducted for sure. He was an automatic. But when he got up to speak and, uh, and to thank his family, his coaches, his friends who helped him in his career, he had a hard time getting through his, uh, his speech in the induction ceremony. So... Uh, the players, when they get up there, they see all the other great players have been inducted, both men and women and contributors, and now wheelchair players. Uh, we've got about six wheelchair players now that have been inducted over the last five years. And so uh, they realize that they're in a very special fraternity of other players and, uh, and idols that they had when they were growing up, you know, have their names in it. And one of the great, um, one of the great, items they have there is a hologram of Roger Federer. Now, Roger is not in the Hall of Fame yet. He might make it. Uh, but uh, we have a rule that you have to be uh, not of consequence on the tour for five years. Uh, and we have some issues now. I'll talk about that in a second. But Roger did a, a hologram for us. And so 
he, you go into a little room, they push the button, and Roger comes out, he's uh, full size. And he, he talks about the 10 reasons why he loves tennis. And it's interspersed during this presentation, his accomplishments and victories and, and uh, you know, how great a player he was. But he talks about, you know, he loved to hit the ball. He loved to move. He loved to travel. He loved to uh, be with his buddies. Uh, and the very last thing he said, I, I played because it was really fun. And that's what we do with our academy here. We try to encourage the kids to have fun, to play the game. And they start usually playing the game because it's fun. And sometimes it gets tiresome when they're out there every single day. And then when you get in the pro tour, you know, it's your, it's your job. But um, the, uh, I was going to say about the next inductions that are going to take place are very special because you've got players like Federer, Serena, Venus, Nadal, and pretty soon Djokovic, uh, Andy Murray, all those great players are going to be eligible to be inducted. And, and ideally, we want to have one player inducted each year. But we do want to make it legitimate. We don't want to you know, uh, try to fix it so that we only have a player that should be inducted inducted the next year. So I'm not sure what they're going to do. It's not my problem anymore. But um, it, uh, it's been fun because I was the chairman of the Enshrinement Nominating Committee. We nominated the players that uh, would be put onto the ballot and voted on by the voting groups. And so uh, it, it was a – we had 22 members of, the, of this committee that were all either ex-players, historians, uh, media, and they had 22 different opinions of what was to take place, who should be on the ballot. And, and it, was a, uh, it was one of my uh, least favorite days you know, chairing this, this group at Wimbledon each year. So we're going to have a, a great group, and, and they're already planning to do something really special for those players who are not just great players, but they could be considered, after me, the best players who've ever played the game. <laughs> So you got you got Djokovic and Nadal and Federer who have all won over 20 Grand Slams and and they're all uh, up until last year were playing at the same at, you know during our time and so it was a very special period and of course Serena and Venus um, were doing the same thing on the women's side so it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Stan, we're here talking to a, a bunch of Islanders and you've had an opportunity to travel all over the world. What brought you to Sea Pines? Hilton Head, excuse me. I yeah, well, uh, I actually was uh, drafted, and uh, my number was 23. Some of you guys might understand what that means. I was going to go in, so I actually dodged the draft for about a year, and I did it by playing Davis Cup, representing in the United States. And so it was legitimate. I said, well, i got to play this next match and the next match. And then I got to the Masters. The first Masters, the ATP final, was in Tokyo. And... Uh, uh, I was in a, I was in the, it was a round robin situation. I was play Rosewall, and the winner of that match was going to win the uh, the Masters. And um, so that day, uh, to I was to play him. I got a telegram from the State Department saying, "You must report." This is December fourteenth. I was in Tokyo. You must report to the draft board on December sixteenth. <laughs> and it was also my birthday, so it was three big, you know, moments. And um, so I had to. I played Rosewall. I was fortunate to win that match, and then I had to play Arthur Ashe the next night, the fifteenth, at about seven o'clock. And there was a, a midnight flight from Tokyo to L.A. So I got that flight, and I got to L.A. Of course, on the fifteenth because of the time change. I went home to Pasadena. The next morning, I went to the uh, draft board. I was, I somehow made it through the physical, and uh, I had a choice. I could either get in the bus just outdoors uh, of this building and go to Fort Ord near Monterey and be there from the 16th until the 27th during Christmas, um, and I'd get paid. It was like $128 a month, so I'd, that was important. Or I could take excess leave, 11 days, uh, which would not account on my leave time, and I could go home and be there for 11 days. So I've been, like I said, dodging the drive. I've been traveling nonstop for almost the whole year. I hadn't been home. So I went home at Christmas and then went up to Fort Ord. After basic, I was going to Washington where I was going to be based. 
And uh, I stopped here on the way. And Charles Frazier had just started the tournament in 69. And uh, he was also, um, he was not athletic, but he was a, uh, a student of trends in resort business. And he realized tennis was getting popular, very popular. And so in the early 70s, and so he wanted to get a touring pro. I stopped by, and as most people that live here now, they come here, they stay here for a few days, and they fall in love with the place. And I became the touring pro in April of 1971. Uh, and then I continued traveling uh, during that time. But So that, that was before you won your first U.S. Open? Yes, that was uh, before. I won the U.S. Open in September. So I, Charles got me a condo in Harbor Town, Schooner Court, uh, with a green shag rug, which was <laughs> not one that I'd pick out if I was doing it. But he gave it to me for free. And so um, that was the start of being here at Hilton Head. And uh, we raised our four children here, and uh, it's, it's, uh, I never wanted to leave. And in fact, I always thought I was going to go back to California. My wife had gone to, she's from New York, she went to school in La Jolla, and I met her down in La Jolla taking a tennis lesson from the same pro that she was taking tennis lessons from, from. and she had broken her arm and asked me to sign her cast, and it was, you know, really cute. Um, and uh, I always thought we'd go back to California, and, and I was on the beach with Reggie Bray, who is, some of you guys may know, and he asked me a question. He said, what are you going to do? I said, well, we're probably going to go back to California. And he said, why? And I never, I never could answer the question. And that's why we stayed here. Um, your wife, Margie, Margie Gengler, um, um, had, a, had a very very accomplished tennis background. If you could touch on that, as well as um, you've had some great success, continued success with your kids in tennis. Yeah, she, uh, my wife played junior tennis, and she was from New York, and she went to this school, Bishop School for Girls, and it, was, it wasn't a tennis academy, but it was sort of like that. They had a good team, and uh, she was able to play and, and, uh, and improve her game. And In fact, she won more trophies than I did as a junior, because I was a, kind of a late bloomer. I like basketball, and then... Uh, Bobby Crimmins wouldn't have had me on the team. So I said, well, I probably should play tennis. So we finally uh, uh, got married. We dated a little bit. I took her out on her 18th birthday, the first date we had. Um, but we, we came down here, and we've had uh, our four kids you know, were raised here. And the reason I'm wearing this particular shirt is because uh, it's not Georgia Tech. It just says... Uh, a D on it, and uh, it, my son is my oldest son is a coach at Duke. He's a tennis coach at Duke, and he just became just named Coach of the Year of the ACC. So, uh, yeah, it was a. They lost to Virginia three times, but uh, he still was voted by the. He didn't. They didn't lose to anybody else, and so that was exciting. Then I have a son that uh, played on on the college team, and and two daughters that played on the college team, and. So they, uh, they all played, and uh, I always thought that they were sort of cursed to be, you know, my kids and had to, you know, answer questions about, you know, are they going to be good players and that sort of thing. But uh, they've enjoyed the game. They really love playing, and, and uh, they still do a bit. And Margie in 1973 was part of, was one of the first um, women to graduate from Princeton, Correct. Yeah, she was in the first class of women, and uh, she was the captain of their undefeated team. She got this special white sweater with an orange P on it, and uh, she, uh, she was close to the borderline of far, as far as playing on the women's tour. And I convinced her to go on the men's tour with me, but uh, she, was, uh, she really enjoyed the time. We were at reunions last weekend, and uh, she was there with – she loved the odds there. It was like uh, – a hundred to one, you know, as far as men and women, if she be in the first class of women. So she, uh, she was sort of the queen of the, of, the, of the class there. This will probably lead to a bunch of questions later, but um, you, um, there's been a book recently about you, and it was a great book. It's um, uh, a thick book. It has all the letters of the alphabet represented and a story and a history through A through Z tied to every letter. But um, Stan, you gotta you gotta talk to us about um, 
your your association with Adidas that goes back to 1978? Uh, yes, actually 1973. Um, yeah, people ask me about the shoe for some reason. Um, the the book uh, the title is Stan Smith. Some people think I'm a shoe, and uh, uh oh, we're getting somebody to take her husband home. He's okay. Anyway, the what happened was uh, that this is the first leather shoe ever made. It was designed and and uh, produced by Robert Hayet, who was the number one French player at the time, and Horst Dossler. And Horst Dossler was the son of Adi Dossler, and uh, that's actually how they got the name Adi Doss. In fact, in Europe, it's 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 called Adi Doss. In the United States and other parts of the world, it's pronounced Adidas. And so Horst uh, designed this shoe with Robert in 1965. And it was the first leather shoe, so it was very popular. You know, it was really a high-tech shoe uh, for tennis. And in 72, they realized they wanted to get a stronger presence in the United States. It was selling in the United States, but they wanted a stronger presence because it was a big market. And... Um, so we arranged that I'd be on the tongue of the, looking for a really good looking person to put on the tongue of the shoe. You know, put the face right there. <clears throat> they couldn't find one, so they got me to do this. So uh, they had my face and, uh, and his name on the shoe for a number of years. And then uh, after about four or five years, his name went off the shoe and, and uh, the rest is, uh, was history until 2012 and the shoe had kind of had cycles of really popular and then not so much and and then in 2011 uh, they we had a meeting at Wimbledon we always meet there and talk about it and they said well we're going to take the shoe off the market I said really um, it wasn't the best news I had heard uh, but they said, we're going to bring it back in the market, you know, and, and uh, we have this, you know, special plan. I said, well, what is your special plan? They said, well, I don't know exactly. You know, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't that special, I guess. So it went off the market. They bought it out of the stores. There was not, you couldn't get it anywhere for 2012 and 13. And then on January 15th of January of, uh, yeah, January 15th of 14, they brought it back and relaunched it, and it took off, and uh, it went crazy. They did some very special things. They were marketing geniuses. One of the things they did is they gave a pair of shoes in a very special package and um, with the history of the shoe and, and the picture of their, these influencers on the tongue. Instead of my picture, they had their picture on the tongue, and everything else was the same, and they asked those people to put on their social media uh, just to show the pit, the shoe, and uh, it worked great because people would would see there. You know, it might be thirty or forty thousand people seeing this, and it looked sort of like an endorsement by these people, these influencers. But they really weren't being paid. They just got a pair of shoes, and and uh, so it was it was a clever clever gamut, and it and it and it worked. And so that was in fourteen, and uh, it's it's been going pretty well since then. And the fun thing for me is to see, you know, uh, you know, little kids. My favorite gift is to give a baby shoe. It looks exactly the same, but it's this size. Or to see men and women, boys and girls, fathers and daughters, mothers and daughters. You know, the most mothers will not be, or daughters will not be caught dead wearing what their mother's wearing, but we see that sometimes uh, with a shoe. So it's it's been fun to see what they've done, and they've done it different colors and different materials, and uh, uh, but it, you can always tell the profile of the shoe. Any idea around the world how many Stan Smith shoes have been sold? What we know you probably get what a dollar or two a shoe. Yeah, that, that would be about, that right? would be nice. That would be nice. Uh, I need a new lawyer. Anybody, <laughs> an agent to really do a good job, but. Uh, they just went over 100 million actually last year, so it's it's been uh, it's been fun. It, and in Paris is probably the strongest city, uh, but in England, London's strong. New York is pretty strong, and uh, it, it's in different parts of the world. It had to be a, a fascinating time to be involved with that 
um, relaunch, rebranding. There had to be two years of some interesting discussions. Yeah, yeah, no, they they did come up with a, some good strategy, and they were. Uh, I, I consider them kind of marketing geniuses at that time of, of things they did. That, uh, and they did a lot of collaborations with different people. I mean, uh, we did something with Pharrell Williams. Some of you might have heard of him, and then I just did something with Stella McCartney. And uh, that was kind of interesting because she has been vegan for the last 15 years. And she's worked with Adidas in, in uh, designing clothes. And they asked her if, if she'd design some shoes. And so uh, she designed some shoes that were vegan shoes. And um, we, we, we met in her store. We had a, a, a big party for the opening of her store uh, in London. And so the shoe has her picture on the left shoe and my picture on the right shoe. And it's a little different look in the back, but it's, you can see it's, it's uh, the same sort of profile shoe. And so we're, we spent about two hours signing shoes. She would sign her shoe, I'd sign my shoe. And I'd lean over and I said, you're getting pretty good at signing shoes. And I'd signed a lot of shoes. She hadn't signed quite as many, but I said, um, what are these? Are, what are these shoes made of? Are they made of cauliflower, or you know, and uh, you know they're vegan. But I, I never got a straight answer from her, and um, she was wearing a looked like a leather dress, and it was obviously not leather. It was asparagus, or I don't know what it was. <laughs> anyway, at the end of the evening, uh, uh, the, the crowd sort of opens up, and this woman comes forward. She's about five foot two. And she puts her foot on the table like this. She says, sign my shoe. I said, you know, Madonna, that's nice you get your foot that high. But my picture was on the other foot. So she had to get the other one up. And so that was uh, kind of fun. That I got her autograph on my shoes. And I signed hers as well. Um, outside of tennis, um, you and Margie, um, you've done a lot for the island. And uh, I know a lot of a lot of things are special to you. Um, can you touch on the, um, the the meeting in fact of the Boys and Girls Club for you? Yeah, well, we've been involved. Uh, when I was a youngster, I was I always wanted to do something with the YMCA. You know, to you know work with kids. You know, in that sort of environment. And uh, and then a friend of mine asked me to go to lunch with some people from the Boys and Girls Club. And they asked me, the asked me to be the chairman of their capital campaign. And they said it'd take about an hour a week. <laughs> That's like some of the real estate sales. There are some real estate salesmen here that, you know, that uh, give you those sort of lines. But uh, anyway, my wife and I, Margie and I, both got really committed to it. And, uh, and uh, we, we built this club. And we, uh, it, it, we've been doing a lot of activities. And we have the... Uh, we have a gala each year that we help MC, and and uh, we realize that there's you know here on the island there's a lot of people that are pretty wealthy, but then there's also a lot of people that are living be below the poverty level, and a lot of single uh, single parent homes, and so uh, the club has really made an impact. And uh, Bobby's come and did a uh, basketball clinic for us a few times, and and a lot of people have have given to to make that club very special. And um, then I've been involved with the Heritage Classic Foundation as the chairman of the, uh, of the charities committee. So we're involved in, in 85 different charities on the island. And you know, some of my favorite, of course, are VIM and, and uh, FCA and, and a lot of, there's, there's so many great charities on Hilton Head and so many people do so much you know, for those charities. So it's a very, a philanthropic uh, island, and it's uh, and and there's a lot of need actually out there. It's pretty amazing. For those of you who don't know, Stan was involved as a trustee with the Heritage Classic Foundation, and as Chairman Frazier can verify, um, with his involvement, he he stepped stepped down. He became emeritus this past year, but under his direction with the Charities Foundation, we exceeded fifty million dollars last year for, from the Heritage. That's that's pretty strong. Congratulations. Yeah, that's great. That's right. That's that's pretty strong. <clears throat> Stan, um, <clears throat> in 1992, you had a special time starting Smith Stearns Tennis Academy, and your involvement with the Hall of Fame as a coach with the USTA, giving back 
to junior tennis was important. It's hard to believe that's been 21 years ago. Yeah. But you want to touch on that a little bit. And you've got you've got the number three in the world. Met one. Yeah. Touch on. <laughs> uh, it, it was again. I, I always wanted to start an academy, but the uh, the after hours part was a part I was I had difficulty with. I didn't want to have to be in charge of them. You know, 24 seven, maybe two or three hours, but not 24 hours a day. And and uh, we finally organized a situation where. We, we got some houses and uh, we got some great people, housing parents to take care of the kids off the court and and coaches that could take kids to tournaments and and uh, and work with the kids on the court. And so it's been uh, it's been really fun to see kids improve. And some of the kids were not very good when they got here and they improved. And our goal is to get them to a college that uh, is appropriate for them academically and tennis wise. And we've been able to go to some, you know, some some kids have really done well and gone some really good tennis, you know, level schools and also some very good academic schools. Your two daughters went to Dartmouth. I don't know how they got in there, but uh, <laughs> he's got a very Ten smart Ten wife. Ten you tennis, know. tennis. His wife really worked with them, and that's how they, they got in. But um, anyway, that's been fun to do that. I was involved with the USTA with our player development program when it first started. We had guys like Sampras, Agassi, Chang. Courier, and, and we didn't do that much for them in many cases, but you know it kind of goes in cycles. And, and uh, right now we've got a great group of American young men that are playing. That we had eight of the top 32 at the Australian Open, for instance. Uh, and and there's a couple guys. That, there's one guy named Ben Shelton who's only 20. His father is Brian Shelton, who was ranked as high as 55 in the world, and has been a coach at Florida. And he was also, of course, at Georgia Tech for a while. And um, he's a great guy, and uh, his wife is terrific as well. And he actually just retired from uh, Florida two days ago. He's going to go on the tour with his son. And he's a big lefty. He's about 6'3 or so, big lefty serve, big forehand, and really good attitude. And I think, and he works hard. I think he's going to do well. But we've got uh, Sebastian Corda. Who is a great? It's a great story because uh, his father is Peter Korda. You may not have heard him. He's a Czech. He won the Australian Open. He had three children: Jessica, Nelly, and Sebastian. Jessica won the Australian Open women's golf pro tour. Nelly won the Australian Open women's golf, and Sebastian won the Australian Open junior championships when he was 18. And uh, and Nelly has been number one in the world. And uh, uh, I did a little Adidas commercial with Jessica. And I got a crush on her. Margie knows it, so you don't have to you know, worry about it. But uh, they're a great family. And, uh, and their mother was, I think, ranked in the top uh, 100 in tennis as well. So uh, it's, a, it's a great family. But we have, there, we have there's, uh, uh, several other good young players that are coming up. And, um, you know, right now Fritz and Tiafo are the two top, or two top guys that are 25-ish now. Uh, and on the women's side, we have Jesse Pagula. Jesse Pagula was here at our academy for seven years and really worked with uh, Billy, my partner, who started the academy and with primarily just private lessons. And so she'd have like 15 hours of lessons. And her father and mother you may know, are the owners of the Buffalo Bills and the Buffalo Sabres and have done a lot of, of uh, renovation in the city itself in Buffalo and have, and have been great, uh, you know, supporters of the city. And unfortunately, you probably heard of the Buffalo Bills player that got the cardiac arrest. Well, Kim, who is Jesse's mother, who really ran the Buffalo team, had the same thing. But she has not fared quite as well, and she's she's struggling to get back. It's a long road back. But Jessie's number three in the world. I think she's now four in the world. Uh, and uh, if they win the doubles at the at the French, she could be number one in the world in doubles. She's now three or two or three in the in the world. So it's really fun to see her because she could obviously she's going to take over the Bills probably, you know, in ten years whatever it is. But uh, she could you know, just kind of cruising to something like that, but she's worked really hard. And her father said to me she wanted to win a major, and I said, I didn't have, five years ago, I said, there's no way. I didn't say that, I said, you know, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> but if you'd asked me last year before the US Open quarterfinals when she lost to Schwacky, uh, to Schwatek, 
uh, I really thought she could have done it. And this year at, at the Australian Open, she was a, the highest ranked player standing in the quarterfinals, but then lost. But anyway, she could um, she could do it. But it's fun to see what she's done. Now, watch, watching Jessica Magula will be, be, be fun, and, she, yeah. and she's got with Coco Golf. She's she's um, she's got more more doubles coming up, correct? Yes, she's still she and Coco are in this quarters, and I think they might play tomorrow. And and like I said, if they could win that, then uh, they are both very close to being number one in, in doubles. Now that now that competitive tennis is in your rear view mirror, um, you have quite a passion for golf. Um, I know personally that your record is 21 to zero, you beating me. So I know how good a handicap golfer you are. Um, the uh, I did win two dollars from Stan once, and he gave me a two dollar bill, and I have it signed. You know, at, 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 at that's it. and Stan's favorite reaction was, "Well, if I knew you weren't going to spend it, I would have given you a check." Thanks, Stan. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, Stan um, uh, is still a single digit handicapper. Plays plays strong golf. Um, the won the Heritage uh, Pro Am uh, once. Well, that was a good partner you had. Yeah. And um, but you um, you had some f fun times at the ATT Pebble Beach as an amateur playing with those pros. Yeah, I loved uh, playing there. Why, my wife loved Pebble Beach as well. That's a fun tournament. Uh, usually the weather's rough, but uh, it's a, it's a fun event, and you get to play with some of the pros there. And um, the other day, I just got to play with a guy named John Wall, and. Uh, you know, I lost three dollars to him. So, and I just want to warn anybody: if you're playing with a John Wall, you might run into him here. But uh, well, he's he's got somebody helping him read the greens, so he's got, yeah, he's, he's got that added advantage. He's dangerous, yeah. Okay. So, um, the um, you've been involved with the Heritage. I remember a couple years ago. Um, every year at the Heritage on that Sunday morning, there's always a sunrise service, and we usually get a pro to give a testimony and, and lead a service. Usually the pro is picked ahead of time. Unfortunately, if they missed a cut on Saturday, on Friday, it's kind of hard to expect them to stay around until Sunday. <coughs> Excuse me. We asked Stan to fill in one year and did a marvelous job. Um, I know FCA and the worship and your walk with the Lord is awfully important. If you could touch on that with us. And, uh, and you're, um, you shared with me last night about the um, w Wimbledon. Yeah, well, that, I'll, I'll tell the w Wimbledon story first. One of the things that uh, they have at Wimbledon is they have a, uh, a, a saying, a two-line saying from uh, uh, Kipling's poem, If. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. So you read that just before you walk on the center court. It's pretty neat. They actually changed it this year, so you just walk directly onto the center, the back of the center court, and to your to your seat, and <clears throat> it makes you realize that you know that is uh, you've got to be able to handle uh, triumph and disaster. And I've I've had disaster and I've had triumph on that uh, on that center court. Another thing that happened at Wimbledon was um, I I was a young guy, 19 or 20 years old, and I was playing a, an English guy who was about the same age. And normally they wouldn't put us on center court, but since he was an English guy and I was young and up and coming, they put us on center court. So for 24 hours, I knew I was going to be on center court. And so all I could think about was myself. You know, how, how am I going to handle playing on center court at Wimbledon? You know, with 15,000 people and then all these uh, TV and just the idea of playing on that very, very special court. And so uh, you go on the court, you get four minutes to warm up. You warm up and it seems like four seconds. And then they say serve. And so I served first. I served to this guy, and uh, he hit it back. I hit a volley to his backhand. He hit a backhand, and it was going up as it passed me. It hit the back fence on the fly. And I suddenly realized at that moment, for the very first time in 24 hours, that uh, I was so concerned about myself, I didn't even think about the fact that this kid grew up in, in England, and he'd been following you know, Wimbledon forever. And, uh, and he could barely walk, let alone play. And, uh, and so I realized that sometimes when we have issues and troubles of our own, that uh, somebody else may have a much more difficult situation that they're dealing with in their lives. But um, it related back to really when I was in college, uh, I'd gone to church in high school, but I hadn't really... You know, by the time my last couple of years, I was playing on Sundays. And uh, 
And so I didn't really go to church as much, but I went to college and met a guy who was in charge of the Hollywood Presbyterian Youth Ministry, and he worked with some of us athletes at USC. And uh, he told us about these four spiritual laws, that God loved us and had a plan for our lives, and, and that, uh, that man was sinful and, and was separated from God, that God sent his only son to die for us, for our sins, past, present, and future, and that we could receive him as our Savior and have eternal life. And uh, I thought about this a lot. I asked a lot of questions. And finally, one night, I knelt down and asked uh, Christ in my life. And there weren't any fireworks, but uh, I really felt a peace in my life knowing that, you know, I, the, the thing that kind of turned the, 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 the corner for me was that I, what would happen if I could never play tennis again? I'd put all my eggs in the basket becoming a great tennis player. And if I couldn't play for whatever reason, then would my life be meaningful? And uh, that really set the stage of, of where I went from there. And so we went to Bible studies at college. We had a, a, we had a guy on the tour. His name was Ramsey Earnhardt. And uh, he actually went to USC about four years before me. But he was a chaplain uh, kind of uh, hired by AIA, Athletes in Action, to go on the men's tennis tour. And, and uh, so he got some of us together. And unfortunately, now there aren't as many Americans out there that, uh, that had sort of that possible background like that. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of foreigners have no kind of spiritual background at all. So there isn't anybody out there now. But uh, that really helped me in different times. And, uh, of, you know, I went through some tough times. You know, one thing about tennis, and it's the same thing about golf. I was thinking about this the other day. You have a tournament like we have here and, and at the U.S. Open, tennis. You've got 128 players, and only one person wins. Everybody else loses. 127 players lose. And it happens every week, whether it's a 64 draw or a 32 draw. Only one player wins, and the others lose. And so you've got to figure that out. And, uh, and, and it's tough, and it's a roller coaster situation. Not only do you have to deal with it, but you have friends and family and general public saying, you know, what's wrong with you? I saw you lost. Your, I saw your prize money is down, you know, 90% from last year, and, and, and the expectations going on, the sponsorships that you have, the expectations that they have, uh, because they've invested in you in many cases, and so, it's, it's tough. Um, and so going out there naked in a certain, uh, so to speak, is, is not easy. And so I always came back to this, to the North Star, you know, guiding me along the way. And, and Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own instincts. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. That would always, I was going back, I always would go back to that and, and get me back on the right track. And of course, as a, a married man with four kids, you, you can fool a lot of people a lot of time, but you can't fool your family and you can't fool your close friends. And uh, that would bring me back to <laughs> the base. And now we've got 16 grandkids, which I, which I try to fool all the time. And in fact, I'm taking one, a 13 year old who is, um, into tennis, I'm taking in a day after tomorrow, we're going to Paris, going to the French, and I've got some business there. And he's gonna be able to watch the tennis and we're gonna to get together and go out to a couple of my favorite restaurants. And so I'm looking forward to that. Stan, thank you. Um, we'll open some questions uh, for Stan to answer. Um, Pastor Bill has a microphone to pass around. Um, any, any, any questions go? Please, please raise your hand, and Pastor Bill will find you. Got a victim. Thank you, uh, Stan. Uh, a year or two, well, one or two years ago, in one of the Sunday school classes, you were telling us about. I think it was at Wimbledon, and it had to do with uh, rain and uh, pushing back to uh, one of the matches to Sunday, and that was a, a major situation you had to face. Would you mind telling us about that? Yeah, that was an interesting time because, uh, you know, when I got to the finals, I lost in the finals in 71, and we played the finals on Saturday. And then 72, we were supposed to play on Saturday. It rained all day. And they still had the Wimbledon ball, and I invited this girl, who's now my wife, and uh, uh, to the Wimbledon ball. And so, and I actually, uh, that day, 
it would start raining about two o'clock and we we're supposed to play at two o'clock. So I forgot I hadn't gotten a tuxedo. So I went to the secretary of the club and said, could you possibly, you know, rent a tuxedo for me? You know, and because I guess I was in the situation, they got a tuxedo to me in about two hours. I tried it on in this little room. They had you sit in a little room with your opponent right before the finals of Wimbledon. And imagine being in a room with your opponent. What do you say to him? Say, how do you feel today? You know, or boy, it seems hot today. Or, you know, you don't look good today or you go whatever. So anyway, that was a little room. And I put in the tuxedo there and I walked out. And there's some, is anybody English here? Okay, good. The English are not too smart. They, you know, they sit out in the rain <laughs> under an umbrella, you know, waiting for the rain to stop. And that's all that those people saw today of, that, of me that day. So we still have the Wimbledon ball. So we're going, uh, you know, I've got this tuxedo, so I'm going to have to take this girl to the Wimbledon. I had dinner with another couple. We, uh, we go to the, to the hotel where the Wimbledon ball is taking place. But just on the way, somebody gave me a message. He said, there's a guy that, that wants to talk to you. He's a pastor. And uh, it kind of, you know, I was kind of curious as to, you know, who this guy might be. I had no idea. And so I called him, you know, right before I walked into the, uh, into the ball. And um, it was a pastor. And uh, Saturday night, and our match was scheduled to play on Sunday. And it was right around the time of the Chariots of Fire. You probably saw that. And uh, so he said, you know, you're a Christian. I said, yes. And, I, and he said, you should not play tomorrow. And uh, my first reaction was, well, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> and then I said to myself, you know, and I said to him, you know, if I was in the finals of the U.S. Open later that summer or in Australia or the French, they play on Sunday, and uh, I'd be a total hypocrite if I didn't play at Wimbledon and then uh, did play at, uh, at the U.S. Open or any other tournament that ends on Sunday, which everyone did. And so I, I thought about it some more, and, and obviously, you know, I played. But it was a, a very interesting moment. Just for a second there, I said, well, you know, that would be a real statement, wouldn't it? to be in the finals of the biggest tournament in the world for the second year and having the chance and, uh, and not playing because of my commitment. And uh, so in a way, I feel like it would have been, it would have been interesting and it may have made an impact, but, it, but I felt it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been consistent. And that's one of the things in my life I've tried to be as consistent with my faith and, and, and actions that I take. Any other questions? Yeah, Stan, I wondered, uh, your doubles championships, uh, the Open Championship and the Wim Wimbledon Doubles Championship, who was, was it the same partner or different partners? And have, do you keep up with that person? Yeah, I played most of my tennis with Bob Lutz. We, uh, we won the US Open four times, and we lost in the finals of Wimbledon three times. And I lost with Eric Van Dillen once in the finals of Wimbledon. And I also lost with him in the finals of the U.S. Open. So Eric Van Dillen was a guy I played with for a couple of years. But Bob Lutz was the one that carried me the most. He was about 6'4 when we started. And now he's about 5'10 because he was, <laughs> he was uh, awesome. You know, he was very steady. And I was sort of taking chances and, and uh, taking advantage of, of shots that he set me up for. So... Uh, it's very important in doubles to get somebody who can really play better than you, and then it can make you look good. And then the one thing that if you're playing doubles that you have to remember, if people are watching and the ball is sort of coming down the middle, you have to say yours first so that people are watching and realize it's not your fault, it's your partner's fault, it's not getting the ball. So that's the most important thing in doubles. I did play doubles with my wife, uh, it was my girlfriend at the time, twice at the U.S. Open. And, uh, you know, we never won a match, but uh, <laughs> well, the we other, never played the, since. The other side of that for Margie is you were tough to play with because you would not hit it hard enough at the, your opponent's gal, and the, your, your opponent hit hard at her. You didn't protect her. That's the way to win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, your, uh, your success with Bob Lutz, and it goes back many, many, um, touch on your Davis Cup success with Bob Lutz. 
Yeah, one of the great things uh, in tennis is you can play on the Davis Cup team, and uh, and it's like being in the Olympics representing your country. So I was on ten teams, and and uh, we won seven times. And uh, I played with Arthur Ashe early on. The first year I played in Davis Cup, uh, Arthur and I played singles. Actually, I played doubles the first year. The next year, I played singles and doubles on the team with Arthur and. Uh, and some of you obviously have heard about Arthur and, and saw how great a player he won three Grand Slam events, and uh, he made a, a huge impact in tennis. But uh, he was even a better person than he was a tennis player. And he was a good friend. Uh, we were actually staying with him the night before and the night of, the day of, our first son was born in New York in his apartment. And so I. You know, we, at 6.30 in the morning, we realized we got to go to the hospital because my wife is three weeks early. And we get to the hospital about 8, and about 8.30, I call Arthur, and he says, I thought you were in the other bedroom. I said, no, we're in the hospital. <laughs> and uh, we didn't name the boy Arthur, but we named him Ramsey after the guy who was uh, on the tour with us, Ramsey Earnhardt. Uh, but Arthur was great, and he was. Uh, Davis Cup is difficult because you're playing for the team, and a lot of people may be following you, but they don't really know that you're, you know, you're playing necessarily. All the Americans, but uh, you want to win for the guys on the team, and you play two singles, and you play doubles the second day, then you play the other guy who didn't play the first day on the third day, and the other guy plays the other guy too. So that you play five matches, and you got to win three, and and. Uh, and the most difficult time was 1972. We played, uh, we played in Mexico, and then we, which was really the loudest we've ever heard a, a crowd. Then we played in Chile. In Chile, we had a death threat on our captain, Dennis Ralston. Then we played in Spain. And in Spain, I was serving. And there was a guy standing over there, uh, sitting in the stands in about the sixth row. And uh, the sun was behind me as I was serving, and this guy was reflecting the sun in my eyes with a mirror. <laughs> and so I asked the umpire, and of course, all of a sudden the umpire couldn't speak English. And then I asked the referee, and he said, I, uh, he's French, he couldn't help me either. And so I decided to take the matter in my own hands. I hit a serve a little long. <laughs> and that was the stupidest thing I've ever done, because uh, about 5,000 people threw their cushions on the court <laughs> and were booing and screaming. And so we had to wait for 30 minutes to clean up the court. And then we had to go to Romania and we're playing the first time behind the Iron Curtain and uh, against Nastasi and Tyriak, who are the two of the sweetest guys you ever know. <laughs> and uh, the, the linesmen were all related to Tyriak, I think. And uh, so he was, he was like a puppeteer, you know, controlling everything. And uh, it's a long story. We don't have time for that. But it was, it was nice to leave Romania with the Davis Cup. And a uh, few of us didn't think it was going to happen. You did win, though. We did win. Yeah, that was, a, that was the greatest moment of our career. Yeah. As we get ready, it's, it's close to 7 o'clock. Get, get ready to wrap it up. Uh, uh, any more questions for Stan? Yes. I got one. How do you feel about the line call now being electronic? Yeah, electronic line calling, it's really interesting. You go, like last year at the U.S. Open, I, I didn't really think about it. All of a sudden, bang, there are no linesmen. Now, I would have loved it with Nastasi, you know, if he was this guy. Was, you know, the thing about Nastasi was that he would, you know, he'd get upset. And, and that didn't bother me because usually if he's upset, I'm winning. But he would argue with a linesman. He'd argue with uh, the umpire, uh, like McEnroe was the same way. And it would go on for like two or three or four minutes, you know, and you kind of lose your, your rhythm, you know. And, and he knew later in his career, he really knew the effect it was having on you. So, uh, you know, there's some drama there. And you have now you had the challenge of the line calls. And now it's just purely the, the electronic machine is calling it. They have a triangulation. There's 16 cameras in the U.S. Open Center Court, and they triangulate somehow, and they, and the, and the, it must be 99% accurate. And players still will question it. I remember when it first came out, you know, when you could challenge and that sort of thing, 
you know, McEnroe was wrong 33% of the time. And it was probably more than that. But uh, now, you know, this thing is totally accurate. And so you're, you're taking away this, uh, the, the judgment calls from linesmen. And then, then you don't have a challenge situation anymore. Now, at the French, it's really interesting. If you've been watching that this week, the, it's great because you get the umpire jumping out of the chair and going and look at the mark. And then they make a decision. And, you know, when it's this close, you know, the player will say, it's it was it was out you know and the umpire looks at it and he says no it's good you know and it's pretty embarrassing when you're the player you're looking right at the line and you say you see it's out and the umpire comes and says it's good i mean it's uh it could be traumatic but uh to have 100 percent accurate i think most people would say well we'd rather have it 100 percent accurate as it is now more or less than to have in a judgment of a lines person who's not seen it well and on a big it always happens on a big point and uh and it and you're you're going crazy and and players have lost matches because of that bad calls and it happens all the time and that's life yeah my wife is going to be in a large pickleball tournament this summer and one of her competitors will be alice tim and I no just, kidding. do you remember Alice yeah. from the circuit? Yes. Do you have any good stories I could tell her? Well, they're mainly about her husband, uh, Bill Tim. But uh, I don't know if they're still married or not. But Alice Tim was a good player. And, uh, you know, you see, it brings to the point of you're seeing people, uh, some people moving towards pickleball. And uh, my philosophy is that if you want to you want to do something, you can keep moving, at least keep moving. Even, you know, Bobby Crimmins can still move. You know, not very well, but he can still move. And that's, and you're playing pickleball, right? So, you know, that's, it's great to get out there and to move. I know that a couple people are really happy about it. The, the orthopedist and uh, <laughs> the chiropractors, they're saying, well, this is great. You know, I love this game, you know. And, and uh, you know, I've played it twice. I played with Gigi Fernandez when she was here at PD playing in the pro tournament. She, and I said, I got to go watch you play. And she was, she won 17 Grand Slam titles in doubles, you know, in tennis. And so she said, come on out. So we hit for about 10 minutes on the court. And that's about all I've done. But uh, it's an interesting sport. It's very, very social. It's great in that respect. And, uh, but tennis has also grown dramatically, uh, not percentage wise as much as pickleball, but it's still grown during COVID and, and since then. So it's, tennis is pretty healthy right now, but say hi to Alice for me or have her say hi. Yes. Sam, with all those wins, is there one that's special to you? One really big win that you hold in your heart? Wow. Yeah, the, the question is, what is the biggest win in, in my career? And um, besides marrying Margie, um, that was a pretty good sales job. Uh, the, you know, winning Wimbledon was, I had four goals as a kid. And when I was 17 years old, I didn't even tell my parents because they were what I called dream goals because I wasn't even ranked in the top 10 in the 1600s in Southern California when I made these goals. But one was to become a member of the U.S. Davis Cup team. Two was to be number one in the United States. Three was to be number one in, in, no, to win Wimbledon and then number one in the world. So I don't know why Wimbledon was there before the U.S. Open or any other major, but that was it. So... When I lost in the finals in five sets in three hours to John Newcomb in 71, I was crushed. And then in 72, I was able to get to finals, and then it rained out. And we had to, I had nightmares of Nastasi on Friday night running down all my shots. So it rains on Saturday. Now I got nightmares on Saturday night, you know, on top of that, seeing the same thing. And so to win that 7 5 in the fifth set, was uh, was probably the highlight that or Davis Cup in Romania, which actually wasn't Dastasia beat him pretty easily. The Tyriac was the the problem, but uh, those are the moments that are that you kind of train for and 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 they motivate you. Those dream goals motivated me to jump rope a little bit more, practice my serve a bit more, do a few more sit ups, and do some more wind sprints, and and uh, you know those are the moments you then seventy three. Uh, we boycotted Wimbledon, and all the top players didn't play. I was defending champion and seated number one, and 
I just beat Labor four times in a row, so I was playing great. And uh, we had a situation where we just started our Players Association, the ATP, and uh, I was one of the founders of the ATP about a year before, and we felt that players should be independent professional players play whenever they wanted to, um, wherever they wanted to, and uh, not be controlled by their federations, which has been which had been the case until then, through the until the seventies. And so, one of our players, an association, a guy from Yugoslavia named Nikki Pilic, was not allowed to play Wimbledon because he didn't he wasn't in good standing with his association because he had committed to play this WCT doubles uh, tournament. That he, and uh, we didn't think it was fair that he shouldn't be in the tournament. And we felt strong enough that uh, literally at 11 o'clock on Sunday night, our final vote was not to play. So uh, we, I still feel good about it in a way because it really did bond our association and it, it made a difference. And, uh, and so uh, I had to watch that on television. Stan, thank you. On behalf of everybody here, thank you very much. Again, we're excited about getting this Providence men's group off the ground. Um, I'm pleased, Stan and Simon, I'm pleased to announce that our, our next um, guest speaker on Monday, September 11th, is going to be Steve Wilmot. Uh, Steve Wilmot, um, for 25 plus years, has been the tournament director of the RBC Heritage presented by Boeing, as it's known now. Um, this past year was our 55th year. Um, Simon's working hard on our 56th year, and as we work on those deals with our sponsors. But Steve will be here for um, a good friend of Stan's as well. A delightful guy, more stories that you can stake. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to want to tape, tape that one. We'll, we'll keep that quiet. But this I'll tell you one story. Please do. He might want to tell this story, but I'll tell it before. Um, so we had Boo Weekly. Have you ever seen Boo Weekly play? He's a country boy. And uh, so he came back for media day uh, to help promote the tournament the next year. And so I was happened to be the honorary tournament director and Simon had actually uh, asked me to do that. So it was uh, at the media day, I got up and spoke. And uh, Steve Wilmot introduced me as a US Open champion. And so uh, Steve goes, sits down next to Boo, and I'm up there on the stage, and he says to Steve, says, what U.S. Open did he win, and who is Stan Smith? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't follow golf very well himself. He, he didn't know it was really a golf U.S. Open or what. And that was Boo Weekly. True, true, true story. But Steve, Steve will be joining us here for hopefully another great evening, casual evening on uh, Monday uh, September 11th. Uh, but thank you all. Have a great evening.